move forward. Uh, if you notice that over time, these tools have developed into interesting new technologies. Uh, he is an advocate for open source software and is against software patents. He has co founded two companies in his life and is trying to move to New Zealand to start a third company that produces open source HTC software. AJ is a graduate of the University of Toronto. Thank you for the introduction. That was my first slide. So this is a little bit of a time saver. Uh, this picture here is actually of New Zealand, which is a very nice place. And it's even nicer for open source people like us because there are no software patents. The skies are bluer. The grass is greener. Everything's wonderful because we're unencumbered that someone owns the concept of the for loop. Um, Microsoft, I think, patented uh, six months ago and a couple years ago. Microsoft did patent the concept of using GPUs for graphics computation. I don't know what NVIDIA or MD was thinking, but it was not, it was a key insight. So um, did a wonderful job introducing myself. My background is uh, a little bit strange because I consider myself both a computer scientist and software engineer, which means I like to apply theory to something that's actually happening in real life. So. Um, I have my bachelor's from the University of Toronto. Let's not go any further than that. That was not very pleasant. I consider myself an expert in C++. I didn't do laundry, so that's why I'm wearing this suit. I had my Linux shirt, but I wasn't quite sure. I didn't have any pants that would do the presentation justice. So this is, you know, as you run low in laundry, you look nicer and nicer. Um, I'm an enthusiast in high-performance computing, and I consider that the problems in HPC are actually, in many ways, more difficult than the current big data kind of thing. Um, and the reason for that is that the, the engineering problems, if you're simulating a car or you're doing weather modeling, there's a lot of computational density to that. Whereas big data, I mean, there's some interesting aspects to it. Oh, there's a distribution upgrade. I'm almost ready to go to 1004. If it works, don't play with it. So um, I spend quite a bit of my time working on the hardest problems in HPC. That's something that U of T does to you. Um, so right now I'm spending most of my time trying to figure out these big issues. The first issue that I'm currently looking for venture funding is an uh, approach to uh, numerical software development, which is motivated by a lot of the, the kind of theoretical aspects. And I'm an open source developer. I did participate um, in some way um, explaining to MPs in New Zealand why open source software and why so is beneficial to the economy and why software patents are fundamentally a bad thing. So I consider myself quite the advocate of open source. And I feel very at home at this symposium. So I started with OpenCL, which is a topic of this talk. And you don't have to worry if you don't have the background. It's not required. And you're not going to see any code. Sorry to disappoint you. Um, I started in 2008, which is when the specification first came out. And um, at this point, I'm working on some libraries uh, or middleware in C++. You'll see some of the reason why this is important. Um, my goal is to develop some dual license software. I love open source, but I also like to eat. So it's important to figure out how to maintain a balance between open source and not panhandling. Um, so I'm, gonna tr I'm trying to find a good way to, to, to charge for software which was novel and useful. So if anyone has any suggestions, this is something that's really important to me to figure out how to do a good balance. I uh, recently launched a media wiki site for documenting OpenCL. There's really nothing to say about that. It's a wiki, like 10 billion other ones. And I have a series of technical articles on my blog. Another interesting thing about me is, uh, well, I'm also recording a series of YouTube videos. There's a, I don't see as much on this screen. I have to start using this one. Um, there's, a, um, there's a lack of good training for OpenCL. Uh, a lot of the stuff you will see online is someone saying, oh, this is how to print to the screen, or this is how to do something which you could have read the specification for. What I'm trying to do is actually convey to you why you care about these things, what the big picture of. And this talk is really going to motivate and show you why OpenCL is very relevant. Um, there's a picture of what one of the few places I can escape technology. Uh, water doesn't work so well with uh, GPUs or HPC. So this is uh, water polo. High performance is a way of life, so high performance sports is also a big thing. I'm trying to maintain, you know, reduce the programmer physique. Uh, and the only way I can do that is to uh, hop into a pool and be embarrassed if I have too much of a programmer physique. Although it is an advantage of water polo if you're very big. Um, so let's motivate heterogeneous computing and not think of me in the speedo too much. Um, 
So I'm not assuming you have any background. So let's look at, this is traditional computing. Um, this is how I learned it. This is how, you know, most people in high school, this is probably going to be the curriculum until 2273. But we basically have a CPU, which is not the box, by the way. This is a processor. Um, we have a CPU, which is the central actor in the system. We have main memory, we have I.O. devices, and we have a disk. This is, you know, I, if this is not review, it's going to get a little bit more complicated. But the, the basic situation is that this is what computing has looked like. If we had an infinitely fast CPU, nothing would have to change. We wouldn't need a GPU. We wouldn't need an FPGA. But an infinitely fast memory, we wouldn't need any of this stuff, right? This is the traditional software stack. We've all seen this, OK? We have a, uh, a program which the operating system, as you see, is mediating everything from the outside world. Okay? You have a file system, which again, you only access the operating system. The libraries can only talk to the OS. The only thing that a processor believes it actually has is complete access to the RAM. And that's just an illusion that is done through the processor and through the, um, the way that the memory system is, uh, you know, it's an illusion portrayed by the OS. So computing today looks a little bit different. Um, we now have this situation where you have a multi-core CPU. You probably have a GPU attached. You have a network card, which allows you to access even more services than you ever want to access. You have a RAID controller, which is also programmable. And you have main memory. What's interesting about this is that every device, whether it's a GPU, network card, RAID controller, they're all programmable, and they're all capable of doing computation in some manner. They all have different ISAs, or you can think of that as assembly language. They're all running different things. And you know, this is what the, the heterogeneous software is all about. This is a heterogeneous software stack. I'll point out that the reason that systems have changed so much is that this, there is a trend to alleviate pressure from the CPU. We want to offload computation, right? We want to offload memory transfers. We want to free up the CPU's time. We're in this kind of funny situation today where we freed up so much of the CPU's time that devices are actually better at computation than the CPU is. So we're in a very strange world right now. And this is how the stack has changed, is that you now have your program, which you see these dotted lines at the bottom, has access to another device which has its own program, its own processor, its own RAM. Okay? And you see the top stack you know, where you, you see the RAM is connected. We don't have a necessarily a unified address space here. They are separate things. So the goal of OpenCL is to provide a model that allows us to work in this world. OpenCL is not just a competitor to CUDA. It's not just an attempt at doing high performance computing. It's a much bigger thing. So this is how OpenCL sees the world. We have a series of devices here, and we have a host. Now, these links, what are they? Who knows? These links could be network connections. They could be physical pins on a board. These could be anything. The device, what is it? I don't know what it is. It could be anything. It could be remote service. There is an implementation of OpenCL that allows you to distribute work to a cluster. Okay, So the OpenCL model is very general because it's trying to do something very unique. And we'll get into that in a moment. Um, the host part, what is the host? Right? It's a fair question to ask. Um, the host is defined in a careful way as being something that just makes API calls. The reason that there's no guarantee that the host is a CPU, there's no guarantee that the host is anything in particular. There's a lot of flexibility here. Okay? Um, the host basically discovers what's available. You know, what implementations do I have uh, of OpenCL? How do I talk to them? And uh, what devices do I want to use? Okay? And the host is going to take on somewhat the role of the operating system traditionally, and that now, rather than just deferring to libraries, you're going to manage a device, I'm in a situation where my program is a miniature operating system. And I'm actually telling it, you do that, you do this, you do this. This makes writing, writing OpenCL programs extraordinarily difficult. Um, so we'll get into a second what do the devices do. First, I need some water. I'm going to pause at specific intervals to ask if there's questions. So devices are usually programmable. They don't have to be. I mean, I want to convey that the, the goal of OpenCL is something really big and novel, that uh, you know, we're doing something we've never done before, that the computational model has changed. Um, potentially, you can use OpenCL to write programs to control these devices. 
Um, OpenCL is like C99. It's not, um, but it's similar. Um, OpenCL devices execute functions, so you can tell the device, do this, do that. No different than an operating system can say, run main, and whatever you do, go for it. Okay, you can load programs from source or binary. Really, this is kind of boring. It's not that interesting yet. Um, your OpenCL devices have memory. You can copy and map things. And you might have special hardware. So this device might be an FPGA that has some sort of fixed capability built into it. that You can just call it and say, I don't know how you're programmed, but that function that you've been built for to do, I'm going to invoke you on this data, and it can just do its job. Okay? So, oh, and there's a side note. It's managed asynchronously. That's a detail. Now, this is a, the few audience participation opportunities in this talk. It's, a, it's the uh, benevolent dictator type of talk. Um, what does this look like to you? If you step back for a second, you know, what, this should remind you of something, this model of the world. Exactly, it's a distributed computer. So if you think about it, we, inside your PC now, or even inside your cell phones, you're entering into a situation where you have several devices available, several interconnects, several trade-offs, and all of the problems of HPC start to ruin your day. And all you're trying to do is write an email application that is GPU accelerated or whatever you're trying to do. So. Um, it's very relevant, and that's why OpenCL is so interesting, is that we're starting to enter this world where you actually are programming your PC as if it's a distributed system. And the distributed system is a very good analogy because of the rate of computation versus memory access. is very similar to the type of situations you have if you're doing distributed computing. So we're going to talk about philosophy. So, you know, what is error? What is computation? And there's a very good quote. It's printed here mostly for the benefit of uh, people. I will put the slides up on my blog. Uh, there's a quote from Tim Mattson, principal engineer at Intel Corporation. And he, it's interesting to note that OpenCL is being driven by the hardware vendors. Okay? You, don't, you see one software application, one software vendor you will have heard of, and that's Adobe. For the most part, it's people like Intel, AMD, NVIDIA trying to say, no one in software is tackling the hard problems because we're too busy selling people's personal information. So it's up to the hardware vendors to create this wonderful opportunity because no one's around to do it. And um, you know, this to me is what Silicon Valley should be working on. This is really kind of neat that we're getting in this situation that we can start to talk to all these different devices for the purpose of a single application. So I'll get into uh, a motivation in a second, but um, Tim Mattson basically says OpenCL, however, is an unusually complex parallel programming standard. It has to be. I'm aware of no other parallel programming model that addresses such a wide array of systems, GPUs, CPUs, FPGAs, embedded processors, and combinations of these systems. OpenCL is also complicated by the goals of its creators. You see, in creating OpenCL, we decided the best way to impact the industry would be to create a programming model for the performance-oriented programmer wanting full access to the details of our system. Our reasoning was that over time, high-level models would be created to map onto OpenCL. By creating a common low-level target for these higher-level models, we'd enable a rich marketplace of ideas, and programmers would win. OpenCL, therefore, doesn't give you many abstractions to make your job easier. You have to do all that work yourself. So OpenCL is very young. It's a very nice opportunity. So we can summarize the philosophy as follows. OpenCL is a low-level standard, and trust me, you don't want to use it directly. It's very complicated. I mean. Some people love to feel very macho because I know like C and I can hand code my own operating system and everything. Um, you can. like OpenCL allows you to be that low level, but you'll find very quickly that you're repeating yourself so much that you're not being productive. Instead, the role of OpenCL is to, to build the higher level abstractions that are useful for your purpose and to use those. Uh, one of the problems is that we really don't know what the high level libraries or abstractions are going to be, but we're able to search for them. This is so unique that AM, I mean, what's relevant about this quote is it was written by Intel as an introduction to a book written by AMD. So the hardware guys really, really are coming together in such a nice way. It has happened so rarely before that everyone comes together and agrees to interoperate at the hardware level. And unfortunately, the programmers are too busy wandering around Facebooking each other or whatever to say these, you know, the hardware people are begging you, please develop a killer application. 
and we're too busy selling grandma's information. But you know, the, the whole point is we're trying to enable an ecosystem here. And uh, we'll, before I get into the you know, OpenCL 2.0, I want to give you a little bit of motivation of what an application OpenCL might be like. So we have all of these devices. They can all do different things. We can talk to them in different ways. You could have multiple GPUs. You could have an FPGA on your system. You could have a CPU. By the way, the device could be the CPU itself. You could manage yourself as a device, even though you're running uh, the device and host are the same. Uh, one of the reasons you might want to do that is OpenCL is actually really nice at generating instructions for AVX or for um, vectorized instructions. OpenCL does an amazing job. If you've ever tried to do this in C, my sympathies. It's very hard to do. Um, but OpenCL provides this for you. So consider an application in which you have your video game. And maybe you're going to offload rendering to one GPU. Maybe you offload collision detection to this GPU. And maybe you have some sort of low latency operation need to be done that you offload to the CPU. Um, you can really build applications that use all of these things together in a very nice way. Um, you do see, for instance, the Wii U supports OpenCL 1.0. I'm not sure if you actually can directly access it. There's a lot of controversy from Android. They're trying to allow you to access OpenCL. but uh, fundamentally, we're entering into this very interesting uh, situation in which you're writing programs that are using many things to achieve whatever your actual application purpose is. So OpenCL has some changes. I didn't outline the history, but every couple of years, something changes about OpenCL. OpenCL 2.0 is uh, a big change. Um, some of the changes there. Is a, I showed you that diagram where the memory is different. That is the current philosophy. But now with OpenCL2, it's assuming that you can have a unified uh, space. So you share virtual addresses, in fact, across devices. Um, this will allow you to basically just grab data direct from your main memory system using a, uh, a GPU or something like this. Sometimes. I mean, there's always corner cases in this. Um, it's adding um, C11 Atomics. The problem with OpenCL is that the way that you do atomic operations has changed with every single release. So we're changing them again. One day we'll get them right. Uh, one of the biggest philosophical changes is that devices can enqueue their own kernel. So a kernel is a function that you're telling the device to do something. Now instead of the host, as I mentioned, is telling you what to do, now you can tell yourself to do something. Okay? So this is beginning a change where you have a true distributed system. And maybe this is where OpenCL is going. Uh, Kronos is very cagey as to what we're doing. Uh, if, if you'd like to give them feedback, you can give them a check for 15,000 USD and they will happily listen to you. Um, this is one of the things I posted on my uh, blog to directly say, you know, this is a major issue um, with the way that the community is developing uh, because hardware guys love to be secret um, and it, they're not really cooperating very well with the software community. But what theoretically will happen is that we may enter the situation in which you could have several devices operating themselves in a completely distributed way in your PC. So you might have a, a system. I don't want to get into too much of you know the next section. I'll get that. OpenCL is built for a very specific purpose right now of general purpose computation. And I think it can be a lot more than that. Uh, but I don't want you to think that it is more than that now. Okay? I'll get into these specific suggestions in a moment. Uh, there's lots of other changes. I'm not going to get into it. Um, another thing that's come out is SPIR which is a standard portable uh, intermediate representation. This is a, kind of a, a global method of doing a representation of, uh, you know, it's an IR. So you can think of it as kind of like a, a unified assembly language, that rather than doing interpretation or something of a language, I'm going to, rather than giving you a C program, I'm just going to hand you um, some sort of instructions. And you, if you have the implementation, will quickly compile it to ARM, to Intel, to GPU, you know, to an Intel processor, to GPU, whatever it is you have. Um, this is really neat. I don't know, I mean, I'm not a hardware guy, I've never written a compiler, but I really don't know of any other time where you were able to write a single application with a single kind of portable assembly language that'll go to every vendor's uh, devices. Normally, I think vendors really don't want that. Um, but now they're being really forced to do this. There's a Google thing? But is it a low-level ISA? Then why is it in a web browser? You know, 
it's, it's not against you, but seriously, like I see these things like, why are you doing processor emulation in JavaScript? Use the processor. But uh, no, I've never heard of this particular ISA. Um, all of the stuff I'm describing is very low level. Very, very low level. Uh, it's going to be, a, the goal of SPIR is actually to do a very quick translation. That I have this kind of unified ISA, and I very quickly translate to the ISA of, of this particular device. The reasons they did it were for obfuscation, which is kind of silly rather than portability. So this is an accident that we have this feature, because they want to be secretive, but they actually gave us something kind of cool in the name of secrecy. Um, I mean, basically, you're going to allow instructions, because if you see the instructions, you can never figure out what the program does. Um, you can write your own compiler. I have a major issue with OpenCLC. I actually really hate it. Um, that's probably because I do a lot of C++. But, and I don't know how C people do general data structures and all this stuff. I'm sure there is a way. It's just not the way I think. Um, and what happens is that now we can actually target, we can build our own languages. So SPIR is a very positive thing. It's coming out. Intel is the one who pushed this. Um, the SPI architecture is going to look a little bit like this. You know, this is, you, you're used to seeing this. You know, this is a no-brainer, you know. You have an application, you can use C or C++, and it goes to an assembly language. Ooh, interesting, so profound. But the thing is, we can change the hardware now. So you can actually independently change, you know, now you're going to run this on a CPU, now you're going to run on a GPU, now you're going to run on an FPGA. In your same program, you can adjust the compiler to target all these different things. And if you want, you could have JavaScript right underneath there. You could totally do it. Um, high performance JavaScript, it's coming soon, don't worry. Um, so I'm going to talk about my feedback. At this point, you've seen basically what OpenCL is about. At this point, the biggest application of OpenCL is to HPC. So if you're a group of engineers, you probably want to use OpenCL for performance uh, reportability. Um, but I want to provide a little bit more feedback. So I'm going to pause here for a moment to ask if there's any basic questions, if I've, everyone's confused as to what's going on, if it makes basic sense. And then uh, we'll go from there. Go ahead. Okay, so, um, right. So here's the interesting thing is that there is a portable subset of OpenCL, but you have to figure out what it is. Um, I don't want to get, well, I don't want to, I mean, C is not performance portable. I mean, the, the same C program on different hardware architectures could have very different performance. Um, but you will find that the compiler can do really good jobs with code structured a certain way. Um, I don't want to get too advanced. I can show you on a chalkboard or something, but... Um, it can be done. Um, this is something I was working on doing benchmarks to publish um, to show that it can be done. Um, what it's... It can be done, but it's up to you to find out the subset that is portable. That's not as big a challenge because um, the hardware vendors are kind of agreeing. I mean, everyone's using LLVM in the back end. Um, what's difficult with heterogeneous systems is that some systems natively support, say, vectors, vector operations. Some systems don't. Yeah, so there is a subset that's portable, but rather than forcing you to only write programs that can add two numbers, because that's the only thing we can guarantee that's portable. It's a matter that you have to kind of search for where you get the losses and how acceptable they are. But once someone demonstrates to you how to basically do that, you can write something that's portable. But I would also tell you that if you're trying to squeeze out every last cycle of your JavaScript OpenCL engine, what's going to happen is you, you're going to always target that particular architecture anyways. So what you really want is something that's performance portable enough but if you really, really want the last bit of performance from that one processor, you can do it. Um, hopefully that has answered your question. Good. Um, how are you supposed to connect to OpenCL programs? Like, is it just the same way that you make a normal on like, a shared library that uh, you have another open API that goes to the operating Yes. The, one of the intentions is that you you might be calling something that you don't even know that behind the in the back end it's it's encapsulation. 
that you don't know that this thing is actually using whatever devices you have. All you know is that this class now is faster, sometimes mysteriously, on this device. Um, so you can do this composition. It gets much harder when you want to link OpenCL applications together, where I have, you know, it's not impossible, but extremely difficult to build libraries that you link of OpenCL C functions. Very, very hard right now. Most of that is because um, we'll, have to, we'll have to bleep this. The hardware guys don't necessarily have the same view that we do. Right? To them, their job's done. Oh, you can program the hardware. OK, we'd like to have a library, a header file. You know, so, um, it's, it's getting there. Honestly, I think that uh, OpenCL is not going to be directly used so much as you're going to generate SPIR code. That, I mean, that's, a, that's the best thing about OpenCL, is the SPR code. I think we'll see that other approaches where we'll generate that code and, and target and actually build reusable data structures. That's why I love SPIR so much, is that I finally can get rid of OpenCLC. Um, we'll do one more question, and then I'll go. So you. I don't know anything about robotics. I am a, I'm a computer scientist, which means that I sip coffee I, and I draw pictures of programs as a bubble. You know, this program has uh, its NC complete. <coughs> I'm done. So <laughs> I've proven that such an algorithm exists. So I, do, I don't know the specific cases. But let me get into my feedback now, because I think you'll see how with a little bit of dust of some form, um, we will be able to take OpenCL and make it a lot more powerful than what's been advertised to do. And the question becomes, does anyone want it to become this? I think that we've really, the feedback I've provided provides an opportunity for OpenCL to become something much more than it probably has been intended to be. So I, I really love this quote from a software project I don't use anymore. But the, the book had this nice quote. It said, uh, Deal with a thing while there's still nothing. Keep a thing in order before disaster sets in. This is my mantra for programming. It's so easy when it's just a little bubbly thing to make a little line. And as soon as you ship it, I mean, yeah, game over. So my motivation in providing feedback to OpenCL right now, and very strong feedback, is I think we have an opportunity to fix things or to change things before we wind up having things that are features forever. Um, so most of my feedback is technical and requires a background in OpenCL. And even if you had the background, you would argue with me a lot. So this is why we avoid it. Um, but there is a central piece of feedback that I'm giving, which is that I'm advocating that we future-proof programs. I'm one of these strange people that I don't like having to rewrite software every three days because the API's changed. I don't know what that is. But once I ship it, it's not my problem. It should continue to work. Um, so this is, the, this is the, the feedback. And here's my objectives. My main objective is to separate hardware and software concerns. We have to acknowledge, you know, as software people, we can design for problems, and you can design somewhat for people problems. No matter what we say, the hardware vendors will stay secretive. So maybe we can design to accommodate for this feature of their community. Um, we want the software community to be as open as possible. That's probably why we're here. I don't think anyone will disagree with that in this audience. Um, and I want to improve program portability. Right now, I can't really take an OpenCL application that's programmed for OpenCL 1.0. I can't even link it to an OpenCL 1.1 library. This is a disaster. So, um, you know, there's no stable API. You know, again, the hardware guys have done great, but it's time for us to come in, and they need to give us the tools, and we will finish the job. Okay, so we need to anticipate major changes. And we need to keep software running, even though we know OpenCL has to change. And you know, one of the reasons for that is that any specification we do today is going to be wrong tomorrow. This isn't pessimism. This is the nature of parallel programming and high-performance computing today, is we really don't know what to do. We're kind of stuck because our machine has changed in ways we can't even understand. I mean, how many of us are familiar with time complexity, like big O notation, right? Hopefully all of us. Is there such a thing for parallel algorithms? Not really it's really hard to even describe a parallel algorithm. There's no parallel model of computation that we have yet. 
So it's not likely that OpenCL is the perfect one that's going to work. So we have to say that we want to be performance, uh, we want to acknowledge that we're still at the beginning of this journey of parallel programming abstractions and that the computer architectures are changing. And we do want, even in the face of this complete change, to bear in mind that we want software we write today continues to work tomorrow. Right? Uh, I was working at a company that used, uh, it was the year of Linux desktop for them since 1996. Um, but they basically um, are still running, I don't know if anyone's heard of Applix, really old word processor for Sun. They're still running it. Fine, no issues. Right? And that's because the ABI for X has not changed since what, 1987 or whatever it is. And you know, like you want to be in that position for OpenCL. Um, because it, we shouldn't just break applications because you know you have to get the cool update. Um, I mean, I still play Quest for Glory on DOSBox every night. You know, like, and in fact, you know, I was so happy to get a GPU because normally I just had one of those VGA things and I could actually play games. So I went and like Doom 3, this is awesome. It was 2009, but you know, I got there, figured it out. Um, one of the other assumptions I'm going to introduce is that top performance software is hardware specific. I don't think anyone's going to argue with that. Even between you know, an Intel processor and AMD processor, if you really want that much performance, there's minor things you're going to have to take into account. Okay, so these are the assumptions. And hardware vendors are going to keep adding features and never tell us until the last second. You know, we, we have to accommodate for that. So I'm going to do something called capabilities. It's been brought to my attention that something like this was done in, by some company that starts with an M and ends with a soft, I don't know these people. Um, I, so of course I never heard of this approach. It was something in direct 3D or whatever. Not a graphics person. To me, graphics of a GPU is a historical artifact. Um, I'm more interested in general purpose stuff. So I'm going to propose that we have a capability interface. Capability is an isolated, well-defined, and externally documented component of OpenCL. That's all you need to know about. Okay? And here's some examples of capabilities you could have. Um, the memory model of OpenCL. We want the memory model to be able to change independently. So let's just say that this is the memory model that we have right now. Uh, hardware transactional memory. I mean, even memory isn't sacred. Uh, how many people are familiar with hardware transactional memory up and coming? Yeah. So, I mean, even our precious box of RAM is changing, right? And how can we as software developers accommodate for this? Uh, but we should take into account that OpenCL 3.2 uh, might have hardware transactional memory support. Another capability has nothing to do with the memory model, but maybe we just have a device that can provide random bits to us. That's all it does. It gives us some random information. Um, some of this may be, uh, I mean, many of us have accidentally written sources of random bits. But it might be a good source of random bits. Uh, matrix operations, you know, maybe, maybe what we want is something that's really fast at matrix operations, okay? Maybe it's really good at op image operations. Images already are a part of uh, OpenCL, and I really don't like them, because they have, there's a philosophical problem with image processing on a graphics processing unit. And uh, I mean, I'm very popular when I bring this up, but Image processing is a conceptual problem because I should be able to write a library that does image processing in a nice way with something like OpenCL, but I can't. If you read the articles on my blog, I go into detail as to exactly why we can't build a library and how to amend the language so that we can. Um, and we'll see how far that goes. So um, this is a capability interface. Basically what I'm proposing is that you still have your host, you have implementations, and I can just ask you, what can you do? And it'll tell you, I can provide you with random bits. I know what an image is. Or uh, I do hardware transactional memory, right? So programming-wise, you don't want to program this directly, but you're able to enumerate what it is you assume you have. And the architecture of the application is going to change a little bit. So you have capabilities um, that are going to tap into the hardware, and you know it's going to tell you what can you do. And th one of the reasons you want capabilities is, you know, I went to a presentation this morning on ARM, and I mean, we're entering this world where I'm programming something, and the, the reason that I want to use this device is because it's really fast at integer operations. So why don't I say what I'm looking for is something really fast at integer operations, and allow the system to determine what is best to do integer operations. Right now, maybe it's a GPU. Maybe at some point, the source of, say, random bits is a RAID controller, or a network controller has some sort of feature you can just suck it out. right? Um, so what I propose is basically this kind of thing. Um, and what's going to happen is you basically take OpenCL and you snip it into different parts. You package them as capabilities, and there's some advantages to this. 
The first advantage is it eliminates OpenCL versions. I don't know about you, but I think that C would not have been so popular if there was a C 1.2, which broke compatibility with C 1.1 and 1.0. You know, I'm not a fan of this versioning. And we don't need versions if we say that you know, we have these capabilities. You can do this, you can do this, you can do this. This is your memory model. These are the functions you can call. So a capability would provide, in my version of the world, maybe some instructions in SPIR, or it would provide uh, API functions, or it would be a pseudo capability that just tells us this is how it views memory. Okay? And um, there's something called a custom device in OpenCL. So OpenCL is full of exemptions. Uh, there's some popular healthcare systems that are like this. But you know, we basically say, oh, this is OpenCL. But guess what? You could be a custom device, and then none of this applies. Um, so it's really kind of a broken standard. Um, there's also a full and embedded profile. So the behavior of OpenCL is different if you're an embedded processor versus a normal processor. Um, technically, it doesn't matter the processor, because it, they're trying to abstract it. But we can get rid of that, because it doesn't matter. You just have some set of features you support, some set that you don't. And the most important thing is this provides a stable ABI. Because what you do is rather than exporting the symbols, you export something like IOCTAL and use inline-ish C things. I'm, I've been told there's a way to do inline in C. I don't know it. But uh, theoretically, you know, what you want is to be able to have an ABI, and I do outline this on my blog, that's very simple, like five functions. And all it's doing is allowing you to kind of uh, make calls through it in a way that you don't have to change the symbols, ever. And if you do that, and if we have this capability interface, we wind up being in a nice situation where all of a sudden, maybe I can say, you know, this is what I need to have. This capability is gone, but maybe I can emulate it. Okay? So that's the concept of concept and source translation. Maybe we have a new processor which does hardware transactional memory, and we have the old memory model. But we can take your old memory model calls and translate them to the new system. Of course, we're going to want to be able to rewrite our software to get top performance. But we have to bear in mind that sometimes the advantages offered by a system emulating the old system is far better than what you're doing now. So for example, if you come out with a processor that's just simply 10 times faster, it doesn't really matter that you're emulating anymore. You're taking a hit of 20%. It's OK, because your customers can start to use it right now, and then they get to pay you for the patch, which gives the full performance. You know, there's a whole scan. That's why I'm wearing the suit. You know, there's a, there's a trick to this. But it's different. The other model is pay. You know, we just break it. It doesn't work anymore. Not 1.2 compliant. You know. Um, and here's another advantage of the capability interface. Let's say there is a really popular capability, like image manipulation. You know, well, actually, that's a bad example, because that would already exist. But Let's say another one, you know, to me it doesn't exist, but another really popular capability, maybe matrix operations. And because we've defined that matrix operations have this API call, have this capability, a hardware vendor can come in and say, you know what, we're going to build this into the hardware. We export the capability. And now by using it, you don't know that you're not being emulated. Now you're all of a sudden running on the hardware. But you have not changed the program at all. So this is what OpenCL is to me, which is very contentious. Uh, because you know it leads you to fights with people who know OpenCL. So uh, my proposed philosophy is a little bit different. OpenCL remains a low-level standard. That hasn't changed. I mean, we're not suddenly going to do Java. Well, sorry, I shouldn't say that. There's something called a RAPI or whatever, which actually is Java and OpenCL. But uh, to me, low-level, I mean, I'm one of these people that, you know, if I'm not at like the very, uh, I work below C level, right? So you want to be as close to the hardware as possible for top performance. That's the intention of OpenCL. But you can have higher level abstractions that have minor penalties, but make you more productive. Um, my philosophy amendment would be that there is no set of abstractions that are correct. We have to deal with change. And we should be able to take a program written against the bad assumptions and see if we can do some sort of translation. I'm not saying interpretation or anything. I'm talking potentially uh, translation of the, the raw ISA or something like that. Um, this becomes a buzzword. OpenCL becomes a service-oriented architecture. How many of you have heard that buzzword? So there we go. And uh, I kind of have this weird approach to programming where I kind of wander all over the place. But this would allow OpenCL to kind of satisfy a little bit of the intention of grid computing in some sense. And that you're able to say, you know, what do you have, Mr. Hardware? And Mr. Hardware says, I have this, I have that, I have this. Or these capabilities, I'm not telling you that they're even necessarily in hardware. They might be providing you 
an illusion of a piece of software that's dispatching to the cloud. And if, uh, if you hack it properly, the NSA can see all your computations. So it's a win-win scenario. Um, you know, if you randomly generate bits that are bad, you know, you're, <laughs> you're really going to have a bad day. So be careful of the bits you generate. I've always wondered what happens if you randomly generate a copyright movie. <laughs> it's possible. I mean, it's, it's mathematically, there's a probability. What's that? Well, it's, it's the infinite monkeys, but it's also the infinite lawyers. Um, <laughs> infinite penalties. That's why you moved to New Zealand. It's, Kim Dotcom had some success with that. Some. Um, you know, so the idea is that applications really are discovering services. What can you do? And I know that this is going to be a hard sell to Intel. What the heck is a service-oriented architecture? And why, I mean, this is a processor. But look at processors. Look how much they've changed. You know, processors we have, SSC has different versions, right? The processor capabilities are changing. Now we have hardware transactional memory. So I see this as a good way of, I'm kind of warning you that 10 years from now, things are going to be very bad unless we take some minimal steps to protect ourselves from what's going to change in the future. And the, the nice thing is that services can be implemented in software hardware. So if you see, I mean, now you have a new opportunity. You do profiling. You see that 90% of your time is spent running this function. You've tuned it. You've tuned it. It's still not fast enough. Have some custom hardware built. Attach it. There you go. Very fast now. And, uh, you know, for the JavaScript people, maybe there's some sort of rendering thing, right? So, I mean, not to knock JavaScript, but, like, you, you can suddenly build these really high-level things that are very efficient in hardware that you just can't do with general purpose systems because general purpose systems are, uh, you know, they pretend to be high level, but they're very low level. Um, and the, you know, middleware, another buzzword to throw at you is uh, the, the idea is that you want something, you don't want to use these capability interfaces ever directly. You want to use something else that's going to help you along. And as Tim Matson said, we want to have this situation where we're searching for abstractions. So if I generate abstractions that are really nice, you should use my abstractions and I'll translate to these capabilities. And the capabilities that I use may change over time because I may say that, you know what, now that I have this new hardware, I'm just going to switch and use something else. But if you think about it carefully, what I've outlined will maintain binary compatibility with a heterogeneous system. Um, and there is a final word, and you knew this was coming, is if you have any spare change, uh, consulting work funds everything I do for open source. So the middleware that I'm developing, so I'm doing a couple things right now. This capability interface, uh, I've been discussing with some members of the OpenCL committee um, who fortunately introduced themselves to me and I'll be discussing, you know, they've looked at my blog, but I don't know what they think of the blog, if they're just being polite or if they like it or what, but, you know, a very direct person will just ask. Uh, hopefully he's not reading this yet. We'll make sure this is posted after that phone call. But the idea is that uh, I think that I can do the capability interface now, and that's what I've started to do, is decompose it so that we have this. But if you don't have buy-in from the standards organization, your life is going to be so awful because it's going to be a continuous, you know, I'm doing all the job of making their stuff usable, and they don't care. They continually play this game of making it more unusable. So what I'm trying to do is do a prototype implementation to demonstrate the advantages uh, it is a big problem with uh, linking OpenCL applications. If you build with OpenCL 1.0, you can't link to 1.2. With this system, you could link it. So there is an opportunity. Uh, my intention is to release this under uh, an open source license, um, probably something very permissive. Uh, we'll see about that. And I'm also working on a uh, another version of OpenCL middleware that will use this to provide those higher level abstractions so that if you use this C++ library, uh, the capabilities on, so I mean, what I'm trying to propose is the capabilities would change underneath and everything else will just continue to work. So that's the uh, introduction. You can, uh, I will be posting, I mean, if this video is coming up, it saves me some time. Otherwise, I'll post a YouTube video of the same kind of talk. Uh, the slides will be on my blog. I encourage you to read the blog and contact me. And I have uh, um, some business cards up here if you're interested in, uh, if, you, if you buy me something, potentially coffee, I may be able to give you a lot of free advice. And, um, if you buy me breakfast, I'll, I'll give you a couple hours of, you know, programming work or something. So uh, that's, that's one of the things with open source is that I love open source, but right now I'm really trying to figure out how exactly to, uh, to, to, to follow the open source and not work for 
a company that's going to own me because I dared get training and then sign a contract to be paid by them. So um, now if there's any questions or comments or you completely disagree with my version of OpenCL, uh, let me know. Hopefully I, I've motivated it in an interesting way. Go for it. Joe Hacker probably thinks he can program an OpenCL. Uh, Joe Hacker should really wait. This is still a low-level performance system. And as you notice, you bypass the operating system. This is a big issue. If you do while one, guess what? You freeze your OS. Because the driver people don't really play nice as is. And now you're loading an application on something with a proprietary driver. And you know, I'm not going to give you the Linux impression of NVIDIA, but you know, you you have a big issue. So I don't know that Joe the plumber or Joe the hacker, you know, hacker's a bad thing. You violate, you know, your Fourth Amendment rights now to be a hacker. But the, I don't think that Joe Hacker should use something like this. Joe Hacker should use higher level libraries and abstractions. The point of OpenCL is it's more like something like pthreads, that you wind up having a very low interface, or in C11 now you have uh, memory consistency models, which were totally not by choice, but they're there now. And you don't want to use those directly, but it allows people like me to build the applications that hides that from you. I need to deal with them. Does that answer your question? I mean, OpenCL has really good stuff for Joe Hacker to do right now. You will get performance gains, but I have not talked about how to actually get the illusionary performance. Yes, you can get amazing performance, but it is really, really, really hard to get it. Um, and there's no general method at this point to do that. What proprietary ABI? Because what, what we're starting to see is that things are really unifying around this. So Joe Hacker, why does Joe Hacker want to use a GPU? If he's trying to get it performant, then Joe Hacker isn't Joe Hacker. Joe Hacker is GPU Hacker. Then he should be using OpenCL, right? I mean, how many people, how many Joe Hackers use uh, vector instructions, right? They rely upon a vectorizing compiler and hope it does a really good job, which it probably won't. But we hope for it. and we. You know, buy something from Intel and take the credit for the performance. But I would say that OpenCL is not really, I mean, AMD has also acknowledged this, that OpenCL is the low base level, right? Um, something will be built on top of that over time. Now, if you really are performance obsessed, OpenCL is wonderful and you really should use it. But uh, it's going to take a little bit of time. But if you have something that matches, matches all the requirements, like you need to use all these devices, you really should use OpenCL just because there's nothing else out there. And you want to encourage the community to grow. You don't want to send a message that you know to the hardware guys who are actually trying to do us a favor, a big favor, to help us. I mean, they're kind of, we're this, it's so cute. They're walking along like we're writing libraries, right? Like we want to encourage them to really provide us with something. I don't know that hardware vendors are usually that good at coming together and providing us the general method because usually they want to compete with each other. So we need to support them, nurture them, love them. Go ahead. So an ordinary operating system like you have functional processing, also the abstract memory, the abstract memory. Yeah. I don't know whether you can do anything like that. They don't. Can you run multiple processes that you don't relevant? Okay, so open uh, CL. Theoretically, you can run multiple processes. Are th is there memory protection? It's coming. I mean, the biggest issue with the OS, the reason it can do this illusion, is because you have memory protection. <laughs> the GPU, you have no memory protection. Not yet. But GPU, I mean, OpenCL is a software interface that is really motivated by the hardware. When all the hardware guys are at a certain level, it has new capabilities. So now we do see memory protection coming in. We do see. Uh, unified view with the, you know, I don't know exactly how it's going to, at a hardware level, deal with things like cache coherency and stuff like this, but we are seeing these types of protections. I think we will get there. No virtual memory here. You over-allocate, your day's over. You better be very careful of your array sizes before you ship an application to hardware you don't know about. Yes, very much so. But I want to give you the impression that OpenCL is not a complete thing. 
OpenCL is a beginning thing. And I would tell you that you know we do need something. You know, I know how I made the the distinction that this is kind of becoming OSy. What we really need is something that we don't want to have the hardware being directly controlled by the programmer. We want to have another layer that's just counting. You know, it's the same with the OS. It's the OS that figures out the memory allocation for us. But now we want that's the role of the middleware. Now is something's going to be a, an OS-like layer. So if that should answer your question. But OpenCL, you can't do that right now because they're kind of playing both sides. OpenCL technically provides something called a buffer, which will pretend to do what you want, but it doesn't in practice. So, uh, but OpenCL is not bad about OpenCL. It's just beginning. And if you compare it to CUDA or something like that, um, I mean, OpenCL is not specific to GPUs. It allows you to target everything, but it is a technology that's up and coming, and it is in its infancy. There's going to be a lot of issues, just as you've described. More questions? Another couple. Go ahead. That's the plan. It depends upon how much coffees I get. But New Zealand has banned software patents, or as they call them, pittance. So because there are no software patents in New Zealand, uh, I think that this makes us a golden opportunity for the next generation of technology firms to be able to export technology without threat of destruction or self-destruct buttons imposed by people who have more money than you when you're still growing. Yes, the New Zealand uh, New Zealand is open for business. So incorporation in Canada cost me three thousand dollars last time I did it. New Zealand it cost one hundred fifty dollars. Uh, filing taxes here cost me five thousand dollars. New Zealand you click on a website and they say thank you. So it's really kind of streamlined. They, New Zealand knows that they're going to have a hard time attracting people. That's how come they filmed Lord of the Rings there, because now every programmer can walk around, go to work in their costume, and be very happy. So they, they're trying to bring us over. And you know, they've really, I'm so impressed with how much they've streamlined the ability for you to open and run a technology business. And uh, New Zealand, in my opinion, will be Silicon Valley too. You know, I don't know that we're going to see the creepy technology being developed there, but I do think that you know, you're going to see, you already see a lot of that. New Zealand is primarily architecture, uh, sorry, agriculture. If you eat sheep, you, you've eaten New Zealand product. And one of the things that's happened quite by accident is that the New Zealand uh, exports of technology have matched that of agriculture. That's according, I mean, that's according to the Institute of uh, Technology Professional, Professionals for New Zealand. But, okay, that was probably the last question. I'm going to hang out here. I have business cards if you want to come take me to coffee and extract information. And then I'm going to go have even more coffee across. I'm hard to miss. So thank you for attending my presentation, and hopefully you have an idea of OpenCL. <laughs>